Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. You can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and thesseasofliberty.com. So today we have Nathan Frazier, who is a voluntarist, anarchopreneur, and the host and founder of Live Free FM podcast. Uh, you find that at livefreefm.com. And you, and you can also find uh, one of his businesses, um, uh, podcastblastoff.com, uh, which is kind of related to um, entrepreneurism and helping podcasters, uh, you know, get started. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And also perhaps uh, discuss, you know, the role of alternative media, um, especially with the advent of the Internet, right, and how that's shaped the conversation uh, when before the internet, the, <laughs> the only places you could you can get a uh, you know a, a window into the what's going on in the world is you know CNN, ABC, Fox, <laughs> and we all know how those are so independent and reliable sources of information. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Nathan, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to come on. Yeah, I, I uh, first uh, heard about you. I mean, I heard about you a while ago, but then uh, I'm a pretty good listener, religious listener of the uh, Tom Woods show, and uh, and then you interviewed him that one time, and it was a really awesome interview. You know, you <laughs> throwing him some real curveball questions, which is really great um, to get you know to get him thinking because you know those people they get asked the same questions over and over again. So it's good to throw him, you know, <clears throat> throw him for the loop a little bit, and he did good with those questions, very provocative questions. So, so good job on that. Um, yeah, Tom. Tom was very fun to have that conversation with, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed listening to that. Um, so, so l- l- let me start off with you. Maybe, maybe if you can talk a little bit about your background uh, regarding voluntarism and anarchy and how you came to these ideas, and then we'll go into uh, the topics. Uh, yeah, well, I, I've always kind of been a little bit rebellious. I've always been anti-authoritarian. I grew up very left-leaning, though. We grew up on welfare and uh, very anti-1% and um, was very anti-property rights and was waiting for the communist revolution. And uh, mm-hmm. then I got older and I started researching economics. And actually, Tom Woods is one of those people that his work had a fundamental impact on the way that I think and started reading a lot of economic stuff and realizing that my previously held uh, anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment beliefs, there was, there was much more to be fleshed out in them. And um, so I just kind of dived headfirst into philosophy and economics and law. I think law was, was, it was mainly law. I had a lot of friends that went to jail for victimless crimes. I started studying the law. I started coming across inconsistencies in the law. And from there, I uh, just went down a, a giant rabbit hole of, of how government is not even a legitimate concept and how they don't even follow their own rules. And they can't really exist when you logically look at it. And then um, just got to the point where I just basically started rejecting the entire concept of it and started realizing that without the infrastructure of government, we'd still need some sort of interactions. If we're not going to base society off of forced interactions, we need to base it off of voluntary interactions. And when you start looking at that with a a view or a lens of a healthy understanding of economics, it's kind of hard not to end up on the voluntarist end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, I I hear you. Um, Yeah, I mean, my my, my own path, I started... um uh, you know, in my background, I really didn't care about politics when I was young. Um, I was more interested in like, you know, holistic nutrition and alternative uh, therapies. And uh, uh, so I was learning more about that. And I became an acupuncturist, herbalist. And then and slowly I started becoming more interested in like, uh, you know, learn about, I guess, the politics of food, Monsanto, GMOs, that kind of stuff. And, and so that kind of <laughs> slowly led me into the idea of, uh, you know, if 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 Monsanto is, you know, a special interest group, right? How can controlling Monsanto, <laughs> if they have such a connection, a strong connection to government, how can controlling them really come out positively when they have, you know, so many money, money, you know, uh, lobbyists, corporate interests in, uh, in government itself. And also you have the revolving door, right? So I, I know you still begin to realize that, wait a minute, <laughs> it's not just, it's not just the symptom. That's the problem, right? Yeah, you start to realize that uh, 
eventually when you start to realize that there's problems out there and your first reaction is we need government to solve these problems and then eventually you start to realize that government's not going to solve those problems and it doesn't really matter what the problem is um, so some people come into it from homeschooling and, uh, and and realize that there's something wrong with public education. Some people from the the nutritional areas. Me, myself, I came at it from the legal system. Uh, people all different walks, but eventually we start to realize government is not the solution to these problems. Government is the problem. Yeah, yeah, and it's really it's a real shocker when you when you realize that because we've all been grown up in this idea of statism you know we most of us uh, grew up in authoritarian households right and then you go to school and you're a subject you know you have to sit be, be still sit you know be quiet and listen and memorize and regurgitate and you know ask to go to the bathroom it's a completely authoritarian <laughs> situation right and then the same thing in in college and then and then you go out and you know you still have authority the police is the authority basically so it's propagation of this cycle and then, uh, and then, be, you know, you slowly realize, like, wait a minute, like, um, everything that I learned, you know, regarding history and economics um, exists to basically prop up prevailing institutions, right? The status quo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, then you realize, holy crap, government should not be in charge of the schools either. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and I guess to some people it can be kind of frightening, you know, to think, oh, wait, wait, all this time I was thinking the exact opposite, like I was completely wrong. Like that, I think that's very frightening for some people to come to that realization. But uh, for those people that do, I think uh, they demonstrate an extraordinary amount of uh, humility in that, you know, even though they were submersed in all this stuff since they were a child, they're still willing to, you know, put it on the altar of logic and reason and subject it to scrutiny, right? Because of the relentless pursuit pursuit for of truth, right? You really want to know what's true. <laughs> well, some of us do. <laughs> right, yeah. And and so and so yeah, and, and I think the um, you know, let's see, talking about our our topic with alternative media, I mean, I think um, the internet is a great tool for um, encouraging that uh, skepticism, right, and cynicism of the status quo, right? Not not being satisfied with, you know, you know, this is the best we can do, right? <laughs> it's like it's like uh, you know, it's like those uh, those memes I see with the uh, you know the Aztec human sacrifice, and they're you know <laughs> cutting out the heart, and one guy says to the other, "It's not a perfect system, but." you know, this is the system we have. <laughs> right. Well, and that's kind of what's cool is, is we are, I mean, 10 years ago, it looked pretty bleak, but over the last 10 years, how I've seen these ideas just explode and I've seen people take this philosophy of freedom and just apply it to so many different aspects of, of life. And, uh, it really feels like the genie's out of the bottle. And I don't think that I, I, I really don't see, the established order lasting very much longer. It seems like uh, from from everywhere, from like um, file sharing to uh, 3D printing to alternative media like what we're doing right now, like everywhere that the vested interests, the giant corporations that were in bed with the government, every single aspect that they controlled of life 10 to 15 years ago, it seems like their bottlenecks have just been destroyed over the last 10 years. And the the progression of thought that people are now, the ideas that are now spreading, uh, it, it seems to me like the, the marketplace of ideas is so much more vast than it was 10, 15 years ago. And I don't think that they're ever going to be able to put everything back into the bottle the way that it used to be. You know, you know, and, and when I tell people that uh, that how much of a of a wonderful tool the internet is in, uh, you know, decentralizing information, right, making things peer to peer, you know, with Bitcoin and, you know, various uh, like you know Uber and, uh, um, you know, Airbnb, those kind of things, right, decentralizing everything, you know, and then and then some people have this idea of government like it's these. Not only is it like an evil institution, which it is, but <laughs> but that it can do anything. Like it's omnipotent. Like it's God. You know, like if government <laughs> wanted to shut down the internet, they can just shut down the internet, right? 
And so people are like, well, what if they shut down the internet? <laughs> and I'm like, I, 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 I think that's highly unlikely. You know? Well, I think they, they might be able to take a whack at the internet, but uh, I, I, there's, uh, even when it comes to internet, there's decentralized right. internet right. projects out now. Yeah. So I don't, yeah. Yeah, that's that, the ability to do that, I think, is, is quickly escaping their grasp as well. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you can't, yeah, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, you know, once this technology is out and it's made and it's being, um, you know, improved upon and developed, it's, it's, there's no going back, <laughs> it's just no going back, it's like, it's like people can all of a sudden go back to the idea of chain slavery, of course not, because people have progressed morally and intellectually to a certain level that, that if a candidate were to run for president on the, on the, on the ballot of, of chain slavery, <laughs> it would not be taken seriously. <laughs> yeah, I also think that um along those same lines, a lot of uh a lot of like the way that things get funded, you don't have to go to a venture capitalist anymore to get your startup funded. You can just go straight to your community and get it funded. Right. Uh a lot of some of the most brilliant ideas that have, have come into existence on the marketplace in the last ten years have come from things like uh Kickstarter and GoFundMe. And we've seen even even to the point where it's not only just replacing the need for these big giant corporations, but we've seen uh, neighborhoods that couldn't get adequate police protection services in their neighborhoods, and they go to Kickstarter and they then they get a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe, hmm. and they use that to hire private security, and all of a sudden crime goes down in those neighborhoods where hmm. the state couldn't get crime to go down for the last fifty years. So <laughs> slowly, it seems like. Um, all of the powers that be are really, they're in a fight for survival right now. And it, it seems like the decentralization that, that the internet allows is having way more of an effect than I thought would be possible five or ten years ago. But I'm super stoked about the fact that we're able to live at this, per, at this particular point in time and watch what's going on and be a part of it because it's pretty freaking awesome in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and and just just witnessing what's been happening, like since the internet started, like around ninety five, right, like twenty years, and and you know, for kids that are just being born now, what's going to be like in the next twenty years? You know, how much improvement if if we've already had like <laughs> leagues of improvement since then? Where's it going to be in twenty more years? And it's just it just amazes me that uh, you know it's a it's a continue continual progression of of uh, improvement. <laughs> yeah, and. And to be honest, like it, there's, there, it's a double-edged sword. Like, yes, I see some technology that I'm kind of creeped out by. Drone technology, people right. can abuse it. Right. Uh, getting on the internet can be abused. There's bullies that cyber bully people. There's, there's definitely negatives to to every positive out there that comes along with all this. But overall, in, in free people, I have a lot more trust to bring about a prosperous society. Than I do in governed and centrally managed people because uh, free people seem to make better choices than people that. And, and if they make a bad choice, they can always back out of it. But when you're centrally managed, when a, when a bad choice is made, typically <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people end up dying in gulags. So. Right, right. <laughs> it's not just a not just a minor. Oops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's like it's like the difference between the DMV and I don't know Yelp or or <laughs> or Craigslist. I mean, I mean, it's just like like night and day. It's like the difference between the post office and email. You know, like <laughs> you yeah, know, it, it, you know, this is the future. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll see. I mean, some some scary stuff will come out of it. Some really awesome stuff has already come out of it. Um, I'm stoked about it though. Overall, can I ask you a question? Yep. What, uh, what prompted you to start doing this particular podcast? Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> so I started last year in a, around April. Um, and, uh, I had my website maybe like, uh, December, I started De December, 2013. And I just started writing articles. I always intended on, uh, starting a YouTube channel. I just uh, I never got around to it, and I was just doing articles, and uh, and then Michael Shanklin approached me on Facebook, and he said uh, we're gonna start this thing called the Voluntary Virtues Network. You want to be a part of it? <laughs> and I'm like, that's cool, sure. And I never had a YouTube channel. Oh, I did, but I just posted like piano videos and stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, 
I never had like a podcasting thing. And so I did it and I started just me talking about various things. And then eventually I had, um, you know, I started having guests and that, was, that opened up a whole new um, world for me because, um, you know, it's one thing to be just, just yourself talking to a microphone, but then when you have a guest, you know, interaction, it's really awesome. Um, and, and I've been meeting a lot of great people that I would not have, I would not have had the, uh, the, a reason to meet them or to talk to them. Like, why would they want to talk to me? <laughs> but now that I have a podcast, it's like, it's a reason to meet these cool people. So you get to, uh, have great interactions with wonderful people. And, uh, you know, I just, yeah, I'm just enjoying it. And, you know, uh, it's not a money adventure. Um, although, uh, you know, it'd be nice, but, uh, but then again, I think we were discussing earlier that once you start making it a money adventure, it may, it may transform your initial idea, right. Um, than what it, when it started. So, so that you got to kind of be careful of that. So, uh, for now it's just a uh, labor of love. <laughs> and also the way I look at it is like, you know, what you and I do as podcasters, it's like, we're taking snapshots of our thoughts right now for the future basic so you know your kids your grandkids and they're going to say what were you thinking at that time so it's kind of like a it's like it's like a journal entry of your thoughts at this time right this moment in time and so people can go back and they can listen to you and see what you really thought <laughs> that's the way i look at it i like I, I really like doing the whole podcasting thing because it's for me it feels like uh there's this giant conversation that's going on right now that's never been going on before in human history. And I guess at certain points in time, some of these ideas have come up. Sometimes people were burnt at the cross for having these type of ideas. Right. Right. Uh, sometimes people had to meet in, in shadowy corners to discuss these types of ideas. Yeah. Um, but now like this conversation is going on out in the open and anybody with, a hundred dollars to go out to go out and get a microphone and a webcam mm. can become part of that conversation. Right. And uh, I really think, like they say, the pen is mightier than the code. I really think that the um, the podcast is <laughs> incredibly powerful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, that's a good point. Um, that the you know people people are having more courage to speak out. You know, and uh, and. And, you know, for those who want to, who are searching for answers, they're having more and more options to, to, uh, you know, find these, find these answers to these questions that they may have. And, and, um, like, like Adam Kokesh, for example, his, his book Freedom, um, is banned in prison. <laughs> Have you heard? That's crazy. Have you heard this? No, but it doesn't surprise me because it, it's one of those books. It's amazing, though. I mean, and and the way he puts it, he he says this is one of the best endorsements from my book I could ever get. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? We're still banning books, right? It's 2015. <laughs> you know, and and one one meme that I saw, which which was that, which I really loved, was that um, you know, in order in order for people not to read books, you know, you don't have to ban them or you don't have you you don't even have to burn them all you all you have to do is just convince people not to read them <laughs> and many right. people do they, i mean they, many people don't read these books you know it's not even necessary to ban anymore <laughs> but the thing is the thing is though once you have that initial kind of thirst activated uh I, like we were kind of talking about schools earlier and i feel like schools public schools really disincentivize learning they they make it to where learning is not fun they make it to where learning is not enjoyable and uh, they really make it to me at least when I was in the public school system I hated learning by the time I got by the time I finally dropped out of it I really hated most aspects of learning um, but then I started getting into this stuff I started realizing that there were these way more profound thoughts ways of thinking about things that never were ever touched upon at school and I started realizing, oh, there is so much to learn out there. And, mm -hmm. and the, the nature of the way that the world and the way that we communicate now, if you do get to that point where your, your interest in learning is reignited, um, you mentioned Adam Kokesh's book. You can go and download a copy of it. You can buy it. You can get it for free. You can get it as an audio book. <laughs> right. And the, the access to information has never been easier. So right. while some people are not, they'll go through their whole lives never opening. I saw a statistic talking about a huge amount, a huge percent of Americans never open another book past high school. Oh. And I'm one of those guys that I like, I try to read at least two books every month. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> nice. 
it's 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 but it wasn't always that way for a long time after high school i was one of those americans that never picked up another book but that that need to learn was reignited and luckily now you can find anything you want books that you would never be able to find you just go on ebay and see if somebody has it for sale or you go on amazon and somebody's going to have it for sale or you go on google docs and you can find a pdf file of it like Mm. Uh, it's truly an amazing time, especially if you're an autodidactic person like me. It's a, and it's, it's an amazing time to be alive. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, can you, um, tell me, uh, or, or just tell my audience, um, some of the people, since you've been doing this for like, what you said, six, seven years, um, you know, I'm sure you've had some fascinating guests along the way. Um, can, can you go into some of the, you know, some of the people that you've met that, that have really like, um, it, it, affected you in a positive way uh yeah i've i've met larkin rose he was awesome i got to hang out with him and that was uh that, he's he's one of my uh bigger influences and his book um the most dangerous superstition i don't know if you've read it or oh, not. i read it i read it yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of those books that tipped me over into volunteerism i was excellent i was okay. on the i was on the constitutional line right. where i was like a semi-constitutionalist and reading right. that book was really what pushed me over um right. Mark Stevens, I was able to meet him. That right. was awesome. Uh, I've been able to interview lots of great, like, like you said, being doing a podcast gives you the opportunity to reach out to people. Tom Woods was an awesome interview. The, what I've I've kind of changed the podcast that I do. I've I've uh, I've kind of branched off and started Anarchopreneur, which is um, for people that embrace free markets but want to actually learn how to navigate through the free markets. That's what that show is all about. So rather than just preaching the philosophy of free markets, it's about once you've come to that point, now here's how you go out into the, into the free market, compete, and be able to be successful. And since, doing, since starting that, I've actually met quite a few multimillionaires that on the down low are total voluntarist to oh. almost like straight up anarcho-capitalist. And these people are like net worth of like, four or five million dollars mm. and they won't come out and say it or some of them actually will but i've been able to meet people that you would never from looking at their forbes or their fortune 500 profiles you would never know how politically educated they are but uh there's there's a lot of successful people that um that totally get what this movement's all about and they maybe don't feel comfortable coming out and saying it like we do because we don't have anything to lose right <laughs> um but we're from being able to do this, I've realized that we're a much stronger movement than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah, I, I have a friend who is a uh, who runs a food truck, and and uh, so he, yeah, he's an entrepreneur, and uh, and I love talking to him because he, um, you know, he he has such a different perspective, um, and you know, he's very focused on the you know the the food aspect of business, right? And and so the people he has to interact with are you know the. Um, um, you know these food safety. Uh, what, what do you call those? The uh, regulators. Yeah, the regulators, the inspectors. You know, and uh. Uh, <laughs> it's just amazing how he navigates that because. And, and actually, yeah, he's a volunteerist as well. And also, because I hang out with him and his kids, uh, and so he's also homeschooling as and unschooling as well. And so, um, you know, he's, he listens to Tom Woods and Stefan Molyneux and all that. And so, um, and he's saying, you know, the best people that uh, that, that that he thinks would be most. Um, most apt to to um, gravitating towards volunteerism are entrepreneurs, like you said, and uh, you know capitalists in general, because they understand, you know, number one, how difficult it is to start a business, right? How much capital it takes, how much energy and resources it takes just to start a business, and then how many how many of those businesses, how what percentage fails like immediately, <laughs> and then yeah. and then how much how much effort it took to to continue and push forward, and then. You know, and become profitable, and then and then uh, employ more people, you know, employ some people, and then grow your business, and and then in order to do that, you got to navigate this legalese and this these like stumbling blocks <laughs> that you get a lake, local, state, and federal that you you got to do, and then and then, and then one thing he says that's kind of interesting is that the biggest overhead that I have to deal with is the state <laughs> specific, yeah. more specifically taxation it's like, mm -hmm. it's like if i wasn't taxed so much it was amazing what i would be able to do yeah if it, 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 people don't really realize this but one of the biggest killers of business and one of the biggest killers of jobs in general is taxation and regulation mm -hmm. and uh 
more small businesses go under because of that than, well, probably that and not knowing how to sell because throughout school, people aren't taught how to sell Mm -hmm. and they're taught that salesmen are greedy and sleazy and slime balls and (laughs) nobody with any kind of self-respect ever learns how to sell because it's a it's a disgraceful profession and so that holds a lot of people back as well but personal experience starting up a business is so much more difficult than just filling out an application and showing up and and punching a time card right and uh once you actually go through trying to start up a business um it's hard to imagine anybody who's started up their own business and still feels like uh the 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 Business owners that are successful um, don't deserve the extra income that they end up getting from it. I, I uh, that was one of the things that really um, transitioned my thinking was the fact that I, as much as I was a leftist growing up, I always did have like an entrepreneurial streak in me, and starting up businesses and and seeing how difficult it is to navigate through the regulations and seeing how difficult it is just to find success and realizing that. Some people go through four or five business ideas before they find the one that's successful. And to think that once they finally are successful and once they're finally able to, they put so much work and so many failures and so many hours of their life into trying to build a business. And at one point in my life, I was like, well, I show up and I work and I flip the burgers. So I should, you know, I'm the one who's actually working. I should get a bigger (laughs) cut of the profits than the business owner until you try to become a business owner and you realize, holy crap, that is so much more difficult than just showing up and flipping the burgers. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. When I, uh, I I worked as an acupuncturist in a, uh, in a car accident clinic for nine years and towards the end of it, like the last few years, that's when I really started getting deeply into uh, volunteerism and anarchy and, ca- and learning about free markets and things like that. And so I, you know, initially, I guess, you know, I guess most people don't like their bosses. <laughs> My boss, it, you know, he, I was all right, he was all right for me. But I really, after studying this stuff, I really gained a deep appreciation for what he does, you know? Yeah. And uh, like, you, like you said, you know, um, I, I'm like, wow, <laughs> this guy has done a lot. And, you know, you know, he walks around in nice suits, nice shoes, you know, and drives a nice car. But, uh, but, but then when, when you see what it takes to do that, it's like, man, okay, these people, <laughs> these people deserve whatever they got. <laughs> yeah, and you know? the the fact of the matter is, there are some some people out there that exploit each other, and there are people that will, um, you know, stab their mother in the back in order to get ahead in 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 life. And there are some people that definitely live up to the greedy capitalist uh, meme. But <laughs> the majority of the majority of the successful people that I have met have been very giving people. Their entire goal is based off of servicing the people around them, providing the best value to the people around them. And um, it, I try not to get as frustrated as I do uh, with like people that are still stuck in the leftist, collectivist, mm-hmm. uh, pay their fair share mentality because I used to be part of it. But I think because it was such a huge part of my thinking as a young guy, and then because I've come like a full 180, um, I, I, I try to be patient with it, but that type of thinking just really drives me insane. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Exploitation, <laughs> exactly. Employment is slavery. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. I don't, think I, I don't think I went that far when I was younger. Um, I was uh, really interested in other things, but um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's how, I don't know how you can compare as like a completely voluntary thing. You know, you fill out the application, <laughs> you know, you 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 show up to work, and you know, you do your job, you get paid a certain amount, and you know, you don't quit. So apparently, you must like it. <laughs> so or, how can or it be? <laughs> if you don't like it, it, you still know that it's better than the alternative out there. I right. Mean, it may suck to go and flip burgers all day, but it sucks even worse to be homeless and not do anything to provide value for yourself. And without that, that was one of the things is like when you start learning about the labor theory of value, when you start learning about specialization, you start realizing that capitalism and a respect for property rights and a respect for people to do and, and pursue their own goals in life and to, to be rewarded for providing value for other people, you start realizing that um, yeah, some people excel and succeed a lot better than other people do. And yes, there is 
uh, income inequality and that in any kind of system there's going to be inequality if it went back to just plain barter then the hunters that were the best hunters would it would be unequally above the, the <laughs> most people if it went to right. <laughs> a society where people were just you know nobody had to do anything and people were just based judged based off of their looks i would not be in the best position in that type <laughs> of society um but either way no matter what there's always going to be inequality capitalism though gives us the ability to live off of and benefit from other people's advantages. If other people are really great fishermen, I can have fish without having to be a great fisherman. If other mm. people are really great architects, I can live in a solid house without having to understand architecture. So because we can specialize, because the better you serve your community, the better you're going to do in life in a, in a free market, um, we have a very high standard of living and a lot of times people are walking around with marvelous computers in their pockets that 10, 20 years ago, nobody could afford. And right. they've got this great computer in their pocket and they're complaining because of income inequality. <laughs> and and uh, when you look at the alternative, you know, without capitalism, without the distribution of labor and specialization, we're, we'd all be building our own huts. We'd all be hunting and gathering and a lot more people would be starving to death and dying because of the elements than what capitalism gives us. And uh, it, it really bothers me that I used to fall into that, that mindset of, of living in such great conditions and still feeling selfish and feeling like I didn't get what I deserved. And uh, living better than you know 80% of the world and living better than 99% of humans in all history and mm. still feeling like it's not fair that other people have more than I do. <laughs> um, it's really, it's really frustrating. I, I, I look at that type of stuff when I see it on my Facebook feed. And I think the reason that it evokes such a like negative response in me is because I'm looking at a mirror of my younger, more ignorant self. It's <laughs> amazing. Huh? The, yeah. uh, the uh, evolution that we've all taken. Um, <clears throat> yeah. One thing you said that was interesting was, um, you know, the idea of um, specialization, right? Division of labor. And, um, and that, that's, that's something that uh, I, I've learned uh, having studied, you know, free markets and volunteerism is that, um, you know, before, like before I got into this stuff, I was more into like, um, I guess, what do you call that? Um, um, Alex Jones and the preppers <laughs> and that kind of stuff, you know. And so, uh, you know, it's the kind of doomsday stuff, and you're like, oh man, now I gotta, I gotta get my precious metals. I gotta get, you know, water. You gotta get canned food. <laughs> you, gotta, you know, you gotta learn how. I, I, I should have a backup generator in case something happens. Grid fail. You know, all this stuff. And and uh, none of that, none of that <laughs> stuff is actually bad. I mean, it's probably good to have that stuff. Yeah. No, but I'm saying, I'm saying, it's like I feel like I have to know how to do everything. You know, I should know yeah. how to build my own house. I should know how to build my own car. <laughs> I shouldn't rely on anybody for anything. And and then when I and, and then I started learning about the division of labor and how that actually increases prosperity for everybody. Like like mm -hmm. imagine if everybody was was like a prepper. Let's say if if nobody wanted to buy anything from anybody, everybody wanted to make their own things themselves. How much poorer we would be <laughs> in yeah. that kind of society, right? The everybody only, that wanted. Everybody that wanted to be self-sufficient and only live off of what they could produce mm -hmm. themselves, right. then you don't have the benefit of anything that you don't know how to produce yourself. And in, in a free market where people trade and specialize, you can have, I have no idea how to make a webcam or a microphone, right. but because <laughs> of capitalism, I can have this conversation with you. Yeah, yeah, and at, at an affordable price, right? Because yeah. uh, you know, it, when these things were first made, of course, they were very expensive, right? And then over time, people have discovered ways to make it more efficient, more you know, a little more cheaper, and so so everybody can benefit. So it's like you know, the the poor person today lives better than the kings and pharaohs um, centuries ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's an important that's an important point to realize that you know we really live in luxury like like something as simple as let's say refrigeration right or air conditioning or, in your car or plumbing <laughs> or in your plumbing or even having a car <laughs> <You're> right <laughs> you know? um so yeah there's there's so much there's so much that people take for granted and uh and I, I don't, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess there's a general vilification of the word capitalism because they just don't understand the idea of what is, what is capitalism. You know, it's just voluntary exchange between two, uh, you know, peaceful individuals, right? And, 
and uh, and and people are like, well, what if people are gonna you know rob from you and steal in your in your perfect paradise? You don't think there's gonna be everybody? You think everyone's gonna be angels? I'm like, well, obviously that's not a voluntary interaction, so that can't be considered <laughs> capitalism. It's called it's in a different category. It's called theft. It's called fraud. <laughs> it's called assault. And with the state. <laughs> It still happens. People still steal. Right. <laughs> most most thefts go unsolved. The police don't solve most thefts. Most robberies, most violent crimes go unsolved. And instead of being protected from these things, we've just institutionalized them. We have a, a system based off of theft. We have a system based off of murder. So, like... The idea that without the state, people might murder and steal from each other. Well, the state just makes a legitimization of theft and murder. So I don't see how that's a legitimate argument at all. Yeah, the idea of legal plunder. Oh, yeah, it's very, very important idea to get across. Um, and I, I like the way Mark Stevens describes the state when he, in his videos. He, he says, uh, you know, the, the, the state is just, uh, you know, men and women with guns that force you to pay them. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it, you know. It's like, and then, and then you take Larkin Rose's idea of the the belief in authority that they're they're considered, you know, their threats of violence are considered legitimate because people have this belief in authority, right? So, the, so they're not viewed as illegitimate like the mafia would be viewed as they're viewed as a state and they're legitimate, right? The laws they're not called threats of violence; they're called laws, right? It's not called it's not called theft; it's called taxation <laughs> because they passed a law. They wrote it down somewhere, you know, in the federal registry. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like one of those things that if a private person does the exact same thing that a government does, um. You, you end up behind bars, but if you're a government and you do the same thing, you end up building the bars. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my, uh, a lot of my family members are uh, uh, Democrats, and especially oh. my, uh, my, my mother, she's a firm uh, Bernie Sanders supporter. She's a, oh. she, she, she enjoys calling herself a socialist. Um, but, uh, which I guess, you know, she, she, she thinks of it more as a cozy term, not necessarily associated with all the, you know, democide and murder that we associate the term with. But, um, um, you know, I, I ask the simple questions that, um, you know, Larkin Rose talks about, you know, just a simple question, like, like, can I steal from my neighbor? No. If a group of us get together, can we steal from our neighbor? No. Okay, what if we elect a politician to steal from my neighbor? And then before I even get to that third question, she's like, I know where you're going with this, and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You're planting seeds, and may, maybe one day they'll sprout. I was, I was where she was at 10 years now, about 15 years ago. Um, and it's, it's just the... Yeah, we get we get trapped in that way of thinking, and um, eventually you start to realize that oh, it's it's like the Lord of the Rings. Doesn't matter who's holding the ring. Eventually, you realize that the ring is not going to solve the problem, and just trading who's holding it is not going to make it better. And you realize you need to throw it into you need to throw it into the fire pit, and uh, hopefully, I, I I don't know how smooth the transition is going to be, but I'm fairly confident that um, that. This whole structure eventually is going to end up being tossed into the fire pit because it's it's not sustainable. And every time they try to, they do these little tweaks to it, and they now let's try this experiment of running it this way. Let's try and do it this way. Let's use this kind of constitution. Let's limit it this way. Let's give it these powers. And every single time, it ends up blowing up. And the more limited it is, the less power it has. Usually, the better the people, the society are. But um, eventually, somebody eventually somebody's going to say, "Okay, let's try and do a society just without it at all," and it's going to be, uh, in my opinion, it's going to be something that's just it, like what we've been watching with what technology does. When one society finally does do it, they're going to be so prosperous, and um, they're going to find ways to solve things in a way that shows people, "Hey, your old model is garbage," and it's so you know 21st century <laughs> catch up with the times <laughs> and uh i i really i don't know if it's going to be in our lifetime or not but i really don't see uh the state being long for this world i don't think that i don't think that it's going to last more than a few more generations yeah yeah hopefully i mean um you know i'd like to think uh of the idea that if the state were you know divorced from all of the weapons and power that it would be just like an, uh, uh, another business venture with a crappy product that nobody wants to buy <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and like you said, it's the it's the 
concept that they're allowed to use weapons and, and threats of violence to get us to purchase their products and services. And eventually enough people are going to say, no, you need to do business the same way everybody else does. We've let you for thousands of years, we've let you operate in a way that's completely unnatural to how everybody else has to operate. And we're realizing that all of these other things are advancing and making our lives so much better. And you guys are still over here just making bombs and cages. <laughs> and we're past that. And eventually, eventually the people that still want to hold on to the bombs and cages, they're just, I, I just, uh, I don't think it's going to happen without them thrashing and, and violently going down without a fight. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen without some resistance, but, uh, I am, I'm hopeful that maybe people will be able to peacefully evolve into it. And either way, though, I, I don't think that statism, statism is an idea that's going to last for, for very much longer. Of course not. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I look at it the same way as chain slavery, that people thought it was, uh, it was you know, acceptable for, you know, for people to own, own humans. And, uh, and, and, you know, s slavery was not completely done away with, <laughs> right? We still have... Uh, uh, you know, slavery under the state. So, so once that's done away with, it's a one-way street. You know, there's it, just it's just improvement the way I see it. Um, but um, so, so yeah, I'm very hopeful. And the other thing with the internet that I see, um, another positive is that to me, it breaks down state uh, borders. Right? Yeah. You know, yep. you, you can't hate people when you can just talk to them on Skype <laughs> or Facebook or <laughs> wherever, you know, social media, any kind of social media. You can't hate people anymore, despite what the propaganda, despite what the politicians and the media says that these people are so evil and they want to destroy our country. And they, you know, at the first chance they get, they would invade. <laughs> and then you get on, you know, Skype, do you want to destroy us? No, I just, I just want to go to work and, you know, provide for my family and raise my <laughs> kids and, you know, put food on the table. That's all they want to do. What are you talking about? I don't want to invade anybody. Well, and now with like the advent of virtual assistants, I don't know if you know what a virtual assistant is, but you can basically hire somebody to do a lot of your menial tasks for you online. And you can hire somebody from North Korea. Well, not North Korea, but you can hire somebody from South Korea. You can hire somebody from the Philippines. Right. Um, I, I commerce. Hear, I did hear about that. I think my brother told me about that. One site is called uh, Your, Your Man in India. Yep, about, that's a good site. Right. <laughs> so so you can hire people all over the world now. You can interact with people all over the world. Commerce is bringing people together and it's totally destroying the 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 um the old imaginary barriers and people are starting to see, hey, the whole, you know, we're not the only good guys in the world and everybody else is bad evil doers that we need to be protected from by our almighty government a lot of people are starting to realize that that's not really the way that it is and uh i mean we still have like north korea where i think they have like a very closed off internet i think china has a very restricted internet there mm. we still have vestiges of state being able to hold back some of these um holes in the dam that mm. are are leaking all over the place but <laughs> i really i really don't see it being very much longer before it just explodes and and um i'm not making like a bomb threat there but <laughs> i'm just saying i don't see <laughs> i don't see it very much i don't see it holding together very much longer before it all falls apart and uh something better replaces it and i think that um there's a lot of people that are are working very hard to replace it and there's a lot of smart people that are creating all these different counter economies and and um, different solutions to things like you were talking about uh, uber and airbnb there's people that are creating security agencies like the viper police force in detroit mm. uh, there's people like cody wilson who's making um anti-protection laws completely obsolete with his 3d printed guns uh there's people in every single aspect of life that are making the state completely irrelevant and um i i just <laughs> I, mean, I feel like i'm beating a dead horse but i really don't see it lasting very much longer yeah, yeah. Some people ask me, like, um, you know, you talk about, you know, how the state is so evil and, and laws are oppressive and taxation is theft. And, and they're like, so what can I do? What should I do to improve, you know, the state of affairs? And, um, you know, I think uh, I like Jeffrey Tucker's uh, advice, uh, which is basically find something that you're good at and that you love to do and do it to the best of your ability.
<laughs> because if everybody did that, um, I, mean, I guess that would be like that's the specialization, yeah, the division of labor. You know, we would all contribute our talents at something that we're you know um, extraordinary skilled at. Then you know, imagine the the, the progress that that could be achieved, right? Um, so I, I think I think you know, and the, the very very last thing I would say after you exhaust all the possibilities would be run for office <laughs> that would never be my first option because i'm like no stay away from that that's a waste of time you're gonna you know it's gonna drain your life drain your your energy and just <clears throat> suck the soul right out of you <laughs> you know just you know um you know connect with people on a daily basis right talk to people talk to your friends and family and neighbors right that's how you improve the world you know raise your kids you know empathetically and peacefully and and rationally and 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 lovingly, and that's it. You know, it's like it, it's not a magic formula for improving the and, world. And I think um, one of the things that's great is is from my own personal take is how easily commerce is done now, especially with things like Bitcoin making it to where any, people in Africa who can't get a bank account but can now buy, sell, and trade with people in America based off of Bitcoin and cell phones. Mm, yeah, um, right. The ability to set up a storefront on on uh, on eBay or it, Etsy or all these different uh, types of websites, the ability to to come up with an idea, sketch up or or build a a, a, uh, a an invention and and put it out there and go to Kickstarter or there's so much more opportunity for people that want to follow their own dreams and want to bring their dreams to reality and want to better the world that don't require having to run for office like it's a uh, it's it's a really I, it's scary that we live in a time where um there are definitely some very people with bad motives i think in in high positions of power and i'm not sure that it's ever not been that way uh but if you only look at that side of the coin, it can be a very dim looking future. Right. But when you really look at what people are being able to accomplish outside of that particular venue of humanity, um, it, it, it inspires a lot of hope in me. Yeah. So uh, before, we, uh, before we sign off, can you talk a little bit about your, your website podcast, blastoff.com? Um, yeah. I, so I'm, I've been a podcaster for a long time. I think that podcasting... Personally, for me, it's been one like you you mentioned. It's it's enabled me to meet a lot of people. It's enabled me to be uh, invited to speak at different engagements. It's, uh, it's it's allowed me to do a lot of things in life that have made me uh, very happy for my own personal goals. Um, it's also it's also allowed me to contribute to this conversation. It's allowed me to feel like um, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing with my with my voice. And uh, I love podcasting, and I have a huge amount of faith in it to be able to change people's lives and change the the course of history. And um, so we built a company off of podcasting. Podcasting is a little bit difficult. A lot of people get excited. They want to do a podcast. They want to get out their podcast out there. Um, but then once they've got their first couple of episodes recorded, they realize, oh gosh, now I got to get a website and I got to get a webmaster and I need to get hosting. And there's a lot of stuff that isn't very glorious, like the interviewing people that you want to meet and having listeners and, and getting downloads. All of that stuff is a lot of fun, but there's a lot of work that goes into to presenting your podcast to the world that a lot of people don't really think about when they jump into it. So we created a solution for that. If you are a podcaster and you've got a message that you want to get out to the world, but you're not a computer programmer, you don't know how to build a website, you don't know how to use WordPress, you don't want to have to worry about all that other stuff. We have a service that gives you the ability to host your files and create a really simple, easy to use website. And it's customizable. You can choose between different templates, color schemes, plugins and widgets. You can make your website look the way you want it to look without having to know a single line of code. And uh, so it's podcast hosting plus a podcast website. And it's, it's, it's what I use for my website for, for livefreefm.com. And uh, it's my startup venture business we've got four cut well including myself we've got four customers now and we're slowly building it up and uh, if anybody out there 
has a message that they want to share with the world. If anybody out there is is, po- is passionate and um, hopeful of what podcasting can do for their own lives and for the world in general, as I am, and they want to be part of our team, they want to be part of what we're building over at Podcast Blast Off, then yeah, go and check out podcastblastoff.com and uh, see if what we're building is the right home for your message. Yes, please, definitely. We do need more uh, voices, not only for liberty, but just in general. You know, it just contributes to the conversation, right? So more, the more options people have for listening to alternative viewpoints, the better, right? <laughs> I mean, well, and go ahead. That's that's uh, one of the things that I love about it is I listen to a lot of liberty podcasts, but I also listen to marketing podcasts. I listen to health podcasts. I listen to uh, business management, finances podcasts, like. You don't have to go to college to get this information anymore. Yeah. You don't have to <laughs> right. go get an MBA to get this information anymore. You don't have to spend $60,000 to get this information anymore. You don't have to be part of a secret society that holds all this occulted knowledge to get this information anymore. You, If you've got the information, you can share it with people that want to learn. It's unlike the education system where you have to force people to show up and nobody absorbs anything. If you've got a message, you don't have to force it on them through public education. Education, You can record it and put it out there and find tens of thousands of people that want to hear it. And if you want to find something out, you don't have to go to the halls of academia or the established authorities anymore. You can just go find somebody else who's proven that they know how to do it. And they've probably got a podcast about it. So <laughs> for me... Um, education, entertainment, mainly education. I love podcasts for the fact that I've probably gotten more education out of podcasts, of other people's podcasts in the last five, 10 years than I ever got in my entire 12 years of public education. So (laughs) I think they're a revolutionary technology and I'm super stoked to have a business built around catering the needs of podcasters. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point about the uh, the colleges and un- universities. I really that's another aspect that uh, they're not they're not completely government controlled, but they are like, um, I guess you know directly funded, and therefore you know their 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 um, uh, you know the the pricing mechanism is all skewed and perverted. Um, but uh, but that's another institution that I think is falling by the wayside and will soon be obsolete because it's it's irrelevant now. <laughs> you know you have all this information online, lightning fast transmission, and like I think even a lot of the a couple of the Ivy League schools offer their courses for free <laughs> online. Uh, although you don't you don't get a degree, but but you can learn this stuff. Like you can just learn. I mean I mean you don't have to pay. It's not this information is not worth fifty thousand, hundred thousand, or one hundred fifty thousand. It's not worth that anymore. You know. It's like, and then people are like, "Well, you need a license." Well, yeah, of course. If you want to, if you want to work as a as a medical doctor, yeah, you do need a license. But then again, you know, do something else. You can, you can. There's so many different ways. You know, rather than going the standard route and getting your license, I mean, of course, anything that's going to require licensure is going to be, you know, skyrocketing, skyrocketing expenses, right? Because now, now it's state regulated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Well, and the other thing is too is that. The actual degree is meaning less and less nowadays. Yeah, I have yeah. I have two different uh, jobs. One, I, I design software and I do graphic designs and I write sales copy for, for local businesses. And then I also work at a retail store and then I do my own entrepreneurial venture on the side. So I have three sources of income right now. Um, in my, where I work at my retail store, uh, not my store, but at a retail store, um, there are people there that are $140,000 in debt right. that have <laughs> master's degrees and they make a dollar fifty more an hour than I do. All right. And then when I go and I'm actually doing my work outside, I'm getting paid three times as much per hour as they are. And the people that I'm working for, they don't care that I don't have a degree. I can do the work and I can get it done and I can get the accomplished or I can get the what they want accomplished done. And the fact that I didn't go to school doesn't bother them as long as I can get what they want done, done. And uh, that most of what I know how to do, most of, of what I've learned about how to write good sales copy, most of what I've learned about how to do highly effective converting websites, most of what I've learned from that, I learned from podcasts. I learned from <laughs> blogs on the internet. And so what set, what makes it to where I can make $50 to $100 an hour where people who are $140,000 in debt make a dollar more than me an hour at my retail job and they have they don't have the ability to go out and do this side work. And so, um, like you said, the, the whole educational system, 
the the mass media system, the um, giant corporate structure that has has basically held the market in check and and held it in its grip for the last hundred years or whatever. It seems like all of that is coming apart now, and we literally have a chance to 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 rewrite history or to to completely change the course of history and. Um, I'm excited to be alive right now. I guess is my is my main takeaway that I want people to come away from this interview with. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think it's so important to end. Um, you know, when when I talk to somebody, to end on a positive note. Like, sure, you know, sure, taxation is theft and laws are oppressive and there's legal plunder and police brutality right, and the war on terror and all that. But what's the positive is that it's on the way out. It's going down. It's, you know, it's being made obsolete, right? <laughs> it's being outcompeted by the market. <laughs> right. By the free market of ideas. And, uh, and, and there's no way, there's, there's no going back. There's really no going back. I don't, I don't see, like, why would you, you have email. Why would you go back to using the uh, USPS? Who would do that? <laughs> I do that because I ship shirts. Well, but <laughs> as soon as someone figures out a way to email merchandise, though, well, right, actually, well, I do that too. Well, so, well, tell uh, what, what's that? Teleporters, right? We're, we're gonna we'll get, we'll get there, <laughs> there soon. We we'll, we'll get there. Te teleportation. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for coming on. So, so before we go, um, I, I just like to uh, I asked a lot of my guests, um, you know, if you were to meet somebody on the street that um, you know that was that was let's say skeptical of uh, of the government. And uh, but not you know not necessarily volunteers or an anarchist you know what would you tell them to like you know like a quick you know uh, a couple lines to to really you know get them get them thinking about you know, like how how um, I guess irrelevant the you know government is or a status paradigm is. To be honest, I wouldn't. Um, I don't ever actually bring that stuff up until I get a feel for people. Okay. When I first meet people, everybody's got that one thing. Like we mentioned earlier, everybody's got. A bad experience with the education system, or yeah. a bad they know a little bit about how messed up the food industry is, or they know about um, they they know one one thing or another. They know where government is screwing something up, and it's best to find that overlay in your maps. Once you have that overlay, then you can join the conversation that's already going on in their mind, and you can lead them to it. But if you come in and you try and preach at them, they're not going to hear it. You need to find out where they're at. You need to let them know that you understand that and then use that as a way to kind of wedge it in, um, particularly because I'm in sales and because I'm passionate about selling. Uh, the most important thing is you don't walk up to somebody in a line waiting for concert tickets and tell them about how you think they should buy life insurance. You <laughs> wait until they're sick and they realize, hey, I should buy life insurance. And then you come to them and say, oh, dude, I can totally help you with that. So I don't try and hit people on the street and change their mind there. I wait until I get to know them. I wait until I find where we have that overlap, and then I use that as a way to start the conversation. That's a good point. I, uh, I hang out with a lot of homeschooling parents, and so um, for me, that's my in with them is that you know they're already critical of government school. And so basically, yep. slowly, I'm like inching my way with like, well, if government can't do education right... <laughs> <laughs> right. let's just let's just start to try to expand that <laughs> just a little yeah bit. <laughs> and that's that's the best way because that way you're not trying to preach with them right. you're trying to agree with them and it's much easier to convert somebody or to get somebody if somebody feels like you understand them they're right. going to try to understand you but if they feel like you're just trying to preach at them they don't care about understanding you yeah, that's a good point. You really have to find common ground. Yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not like you against them. It's really like you know, yeah, you you understanding where they're coming from, and maybe just filling up you know the the blank yep. spaces, right? <laughs> There you go. So awesome. Um, so if anybody wants to uh, donate to my show, uh, except Bitcoin, uh, PayPal, and, and Patreon, the links are below. Um, any help would be appreciated. This is a labor of love. I love doing it, and I love getting awesome guests like Nathan on. So if you can help me out, it'd be that much more encouraged to do so. Um, so uh, Nathan, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Really appreciate the conversation. Uh, so this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thanks for having me on. Have a good one. Take care.